Well, good evening and welcome. I'm Robert Wuthno, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the Center for the Study of Religion, the sponsor of this evening's lecture. This is, as you know from the information that was circulated around, this is the Dahl Family Lecture, an annual lecture on religion and money. And it was established by a Princeton alum named Henry C. Dahl, D-O-L-L, from the class of 1958, and his wife, Mary, uh, who have been very faithful supporters of the university. Uh, Mr. Dahl uh, spent a lot of time uh, working with his father, uh, Edward Dahl, who was from the class of 1925, on community projects, on community foundation work, uh, other kind of social activities. Um, and Mr. Dahl, uh, Henry Dahl, lives in the Cleveland area and has been uh, very active uh, both in church work and in community work over the years. He's also a member of the advisory council of our center, and so we're very pleased that uh, he provided the funding for this annual lecture series. The idea was to encourage students and faculty and members from the community to think more seriously about this often contested relationship between money on the one hand and religion on the other. Sometimes it's just a phenomenon that's ignored except during fundraising time uh, at the local congregation. Um, the idea not only being to encourage a sense of generosity on the part of uh, people who attended these lectures, but also to think seriously about some of the difficulties, whether they involve public policy or individual finances or the financing of community organizations. Um, so we're very pleased to be able to offer uh, this lecture again this year on religion and money. To introduce our speaker, I'm going to ask Andrew Johnson, who's a visiting fellow here at the center uh, this year. Uh, Andrew is a scholar, uh, a sociologist, who has done a lot of work on prison ministries in Brazil. Andrew. Thank you very much. Good evening. <clears throat> the Reverend Dr. DeForest Soares, Jr. is the senior pastor of the 7,000 member First Baptist Church of Lincoln Gardens in Somerset, New Jersey. The Dr. Story's ministry at First Church focuses on, focuses on spiritual growth, educational ec excellence, economic empowerment, and faith-based community development. From 1999 to 2002, Dr. Story served as New Jersey's 30th Secretary of State. He was the first African-American male to serve as a constitutional officer in the state of New Jersey. Now, shortly after his service as Secretary of State, Dr. Story was appointed by the President of the United States as the Chairman of the United States Election Assistance Commission which was established by Congress to help implement the Help America Vote Act. So Dr. Soros was recently recognized by both houses of the New Jersey legislatures for his religious and community leadership, but his influence also extends beyond the borders of New Jersey and the United States as he serves as a special advisor to the king of the Akayem Abuaka traditional kingdom in eastern, eastern Ghana. Now his work has been featured in the New York Times, Ebony Magazine, Black Enterprise, and he was recently the subject of a, of a feature piece on CNN. Dr. Soares earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Fordham University, a Master's of Divinity, Divinity degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and a Doctor of Ministry degree from the United Theological Seminary. He has received six honorary doctor, doctorate degrees from institutions of higher learning, and he is the author of D Free, Breaking Free from Financial Slavery, which was published in February of 2011. Dr. Soares' goal is that his congregation, his congregation lives debt-free lives, and he is currently implementing a strategy to help over 1,000 families become debt-free. Debt -free. So the Center of Religion is very honored to have the Reverend Dr. Soares here with us tonight, and please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you so much, and good evening. I'm so happy to be back at Princeton. Uh, I was thinking on my way here that I, I suffered through three years at Princeton Seminary and have been gone from there uh, almost 30 years. 
but I've been back to the university to speak more often than I've been to the seminary. <laughs> it's almost as if they, when, when, when I left there, they were happy to see me leave and don't want me back. So I thank Bob for that. Bob, thank you so much for being uh, warmer to me than my alma mater. <laughs> uh, and thank all of you. I'm always amazed when I encounter people today in this very fast-paced, technology-driven culture who take time to think uh, and reflect and listen and interact and engage. It is uh, the hope, I think, of our future that the Academy will continue to be successful in attracting people of all ages and various backgrounds to just pause and think. Uh, and I pray that our, our culture will never become so high tech that we don't lose the ability to touch each other and engage in meaningful conversation. So th thank you for your presence here tonight. Uh, thank you, Jen, for your uh, persistence in working through the bureaucratic uh, labyrinth of my organizational structure that makes it hard to get me to drive five miles on time. <laughs> Uh, th this, this topic is um, so broad, we had uh, a small uh, get-together prior to this lecture, and it was with uh, people, all of whom are much smarter than I, and it, may, it made me um, uh, consider taking sabbatical like immediately and, and reading some more books about what, what I've come to discuss. But this, this topic is such, such that um, rather than attempt to go broadly into the theoretical answer to the question, how do uh, religion and money interact uh, in, in our culture today, I thought I'd narrow it down more specifically in light of the work that I've been doing for the last eight years. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I have been, um, I've been fortunate enough to live through a number of different seasons. I started my public work really when I was 16 years old. I stopped by my grandmother's house to steal a piece of sweet potato pie. Um, my grandmother made such good sweet potato pie that you'd eat it for dinner and then eat chicken for dessert. <laughs> and so I heard the rumor that my, my grandmother had made some sweet potato pie. And I snuck by her house. My goal was to get into the house, steal the pie, and get out without being noticed because I knew she had made the pie to raise money for her church because that's how they did it back in those days. And when I got to her house, I saw her sitting at her dining room table with tears in her eyes. And the dining room table was right between the front door and the kitchen, which meant that there was no way I could get past that table to steal that pie and go unnoticed. And so I had to encounter my grandmother and I didn't know what I would do. But the closer I got to my grandmother, the more I realized that she was not just sitting at the dining room table with tears in her eyes. She actually was there uh, all alone, weeping in response to something very specific. I'd never seen her cry before, and so I was startled, and I asked her the question, you know, why would you sit here in the silence of your dining room with tears in your eyes? And she said to me, they shot Dr. King today. This was April 4th, 1968. I could not imagine why this Baptist minister who lived a thousand miles from New Jersey would affect my grandmother such that his death would cause her to cry. But there was one thing I knew. I loved my grandmother, I respected my grandmother, and though I was not familiar at that time enough with Dr. King to say I wanna be like him, uh, I loved my grandmother enough to say whatever it was about this man that caused his death to make my grandmother cry, I want to find out what it is. And I'm, my, my goal in life is that my life will be as meaningful to just one person as Martin Luther King's life was to my grandmother. And from that day until now, I have assessed my work and I have planned my life such that it would be meaningful and valuable to somebody as Dr. King's life was to my grandmother. And so through the 70s, I worked hard to organize responses to the systems 
and situations that still undermine the, the likelihood of success, particularly among African Americans. Worked hard to make sure that the post-civil rights era was, was one where those who had experienced <clears throat> the most explicit form of rejection and suppression would not only have access to the opportunities that had been legislated, but also would be motivated to take advantage of those opportunities. Sought to help people resist the temptation to give up. Sought to motivate young people to appreciate the new era in which they found themselves never having to sit on the back of the bus, never having to go to colored only water fountains, uh, having been <clears throat> liberated from the kind of American apartheid that Dr. King had fought against. In, in the 1980s, by that time I was in ministry and continued my work throughout the country, wherever I find myself, often in the Caribbean, helping people do more to help themselves and continue to, to really uh, uh, embrace all of what life had to offer uh, realizing <clears throat> that although the 1960s were over, there were still uh, traces of effects that lingered throughout the families and communities uh, dominated by African Americans. And by the 1990s, I, I really began <clears throat> asking myself the question, well, now what, 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 what has happened to us? The, these people who seem to be so passionate about freedom <clears throat> seemed to be uh, less interested in participating in some of the freedoms that were hard fought, fought and, and, and won. It was harder and harder to get people to register to vote. Many of our young people were finding themselves less and less interested in education, although many had risked their lives to open up educational doors. There, there was <clears throat> a kind of shift that was happening internal to the culture. The, the larger community from an African-American perspective had begun asking the question, uh, how long should we be concerned about responding to the deficits among these people who now have full advantages and full rights? And so struggles around issues like affirmative action became uh, very uh, vi uh, vocal uh, in, in college campuses and around the country. But by that time, by 1990, I, I was the pastor of a, of a little church 14 miles north from here. You go up Nassau Street and keep driving, and you'll see our church right before you get to McDonald's. And, and I had a, a very keen focus on my own congregation. And so in response to my own question, what's happening among these people for whom I have fought, for whom Dr. King died, and who are described by all available data as still being at the bottom rung of the social ladder. What, what, what is happening? And so I embarked upon this mission as the third pastor of a church started in 1937, predominantly attended by African Americans. And the mission was to answer some of those questions right there in the congregation not seeking to affect national policy, not, not seeking to acquire any fame or fortune, simply looking at this one congregation as a microcosm of the millions of people who were still wrestling with many of these same issues. And our consensus at the church was, let's see if we can fix some things. Let's see if we can do something about the crime problem Right in our neighborhood, since, since our neighborhood sends 50% of the children in the county jail to jail, let's see if we can fix that. Let's see if we can fix the crisis that exists with affordable housing, realizing that this neighborhood, while existing in a region of prosperity, is really the poorest neighborhood in central New Jersey. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can fix that. Let's see if we can do something about the youth who are shooting at each other every weekend to the extent that when we come to church on Sundays, 
we find ourselves picking up bullet shells in our parking lot. Let's see if we can do something right here. We can't fix the world. Let's see what we can do about that. Let's see if we can help people who are displaced by this changing economy and find themselves out of work and now need to engage in entrepreneurial activity. Let's see if we can fix that. We were a bit distracted later on by request from the governor uh, because we were asked to fix another problem. We had this serious uh, surge of abandoned babies in mostly North Jersey where teenagers were giving birth to new life and checking into the hospital. The mothers were using a false name and in the middle of the night they'd leave the hospital and abandon the child and no one knew to whom the child belonged. They were called by that industry border babies. And the state was under court order to recruit and train foster parents that would take these children out to minimize the, the likelihood of emotional and psychological defects in these children. And so we said, let's, let's see, see if we can fix that. Let's see if we can get four or five dozen families together and take these children and put them in loving homes. And so we, we began creating a strategy which, which we call a, a, a factory of solutions. By that time in the 1980s, I, I didn't find it meaningful as a leader, as an activist, as a pastor, as a thinker, to spend the rest of my life waiting for people to do or say something that was offensive and then respond to that. I, I, I wanted to live the rest of my life and I wanted to build an institution that was more proactive that could create solutions. I didn't want a legacy of protest, although a good protest every now and then doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> Let's see if we can fix some things. Let's see if we can build an infrastructure in an indigenous institution like the black church, the church that has been the foundation for African-American survival and struggle, the institution that has provided both the motivation and methodology for political and, and social advancement and uplift. Let's see if we can build a paradigm in this African-American institution that would be sustainable over the long haul and would have such integrity that it was not dependent upon a personality but would have systems that could outlive the current cast of characters. And so we started on this mission. And the challenge was, in essence, to build an institution in this low-income neighborhood whose demographic description mirrored Camden and build it such that the vibrancy and vitality of that institution would bring tangible benefits to the neighborhood where it was located. That was the mission. And so we engaged in very aggressive work. We embarked upon some very explicit plans. We took 18 months to develop a strategic plan for the church, and a part of that plan was for the church to build uh, auxiliary organizations that would aim at the deficits and possibilities of the neighborhood. And after creating a community development corporation, we spent 18 months developing a neighborhood plan for the entire community, and the process was interactive with public meetings and door-to-door -door surveys and neighborhood interaction and public policy on what for us was both sides of the street. Our church is right on the border of Somerset County and Middlesex County, which meant that our neighborhood involved two counties, two municipalities divided by a state highway. And in New Jersey, that's not simple. <laughs> And so we began. We began by purchasing an abandoned newspaper warehouse, 80,000 square feet, converted that into a primary care health facility that now sees 2,000 people a week, half of whom have no health insurance. We partnered with St. Peter's Hospital to get that done. We took over an abandoned 
partially abandoned and partially uh, incomplete housing development across the street from our church that was controlled completely by drug dealers. And we formed a partnership with some people whose names I won't mention, but they're very effective at what they do. And we were able to drive the drug dealers out and create home ownership opportunities so that people who had been paying $1,800 a month rent could buy three bedroom houses with spiral staircases for $85,000 and pay $800 a month for their mortgage, their interest and their taxes. We took over two abandoned bank buildings, one of which was to become the, head, the regional headquarters of a distribution center for pornography, peep shows and all. And we got there first, intervened, and convinced the bank that they should give us the building rather than sell it to the other uh, prospective purchaser. And we turned it into a youth center and to a community college and other activities for the neighborhood. We took over another building and we partnered with Somerset County Social Services so that they could provide day-to-day -day social services for the people who needed access to those services. Leveraging the financial and the human resources of the church. In some instances, the church actually wrote checks to secure the real estate. In other instances, the church provided volunteers. In other instances, the church would guarantee loans. But the church, in essence, functioning as an historic institution in a depressed neighborhood with capital, real estate, and no debt, the church actually functioned as an economic catalyst and a planning agency for the entire neighborhood. Very exciting. Church then began recruiting families to take in these babies that were abandoned in hospitals. And we started out with 57 about eight, eight, 18 years ago. And today, uh, we're still in the business. And we've, we've trained 435 families to take in 1,000 children. 250 have been adopted. And we've created a manual. Each time we've engaged in any of our work, we've created a manual to give to other churches for the purpose of helping them replicate the work to solve a similar problem in their neighborhood. And so we've been focused on solutions. And focused on solutions in the kind of neighborhood that causes America to constantly ask the question, what, what, what can we do? And how much money does government need to spend? And how can the local people behave? All of these questions. And as time ensued, and as our work expanded, what became clear to me is that I still had not answered the fundamental question that I had begun asking myself years before, what is happening to our people? Because the family that is the foundation for a stable community was not getting stronger. The young people were not more motivated for educational excellence than they had been. And while the institutional development was undeniable, you could see and touch the value that the church had either created or contributed to, we still had this undercurrent of failure and this undercurrent of pessimism that I just couldn't put my finger on. In the process, we pursued our plan to build a new sanctuary for the church itself. The health clinic that we did is kind of around the corner at the edge of the neighborhood. The commercial real estate that we developed and invited the community college to occupy was on the western side of the neighborhood. The housing that we did was kind of towards the eastern part of the neighborhood. 
Uh, e even the new high school that we attracted to the neighborhood was a little south of the center. And we, we wanted to rebuild a sanctuary right in the geographical center of the neighborhood, not only for symbolic but for strategic purposes. It was the largest project and the most difficult. So we developed our plans, we hired our architects, we got our loans together, and we had our entire model, and we started building in 1997, and by 1999, it appeared that we would never finish the church. It was an embarrassment and a pain. The largest newspaper article ever written about me, I mean, I've been profiled by the New York Times, I've been in Black Enterprise, Wall Street Journal, but the largest, if you want to read a major article about me. Go back to the Star Ledger, uh, two, two full pages, and the basic theme is this. He's down in Trenton as Secretary of State, helping to run the state, and can't finish this church. And people wondered, where's the money, and what's he doing? Would I stay? It was just horrible. Worst time in my life. But we finally finished the church six years later. An 18-month project took six years. But not only did it take six years, it cost $5 million more than it should have, which means that a church that had planned to be $12.5 million in debt ended up $19 million in debt. We had planned to spend 14, we spent 19, we borrowed 7 million more than we should have. So now it's 2003, and we're in this church, and the monthly mortgage payments are $135,000, which was the annual budget of my entire church the first year that I pastored. Every month, the bank took $135,000 out of our treasury. And the question my board had, after two years of juggling between various um, bills and responsibilities was this. What is your strategy, speaking to me? My response was, I went to Princeton for my Master of Divinity degree. <laughs> I've got a bachelor's degree from Fordham in religious studies. I've got a doctorate from United Theological and Preaching, none of those degrees describe expertise in fundraising. <laughs> I'm not the director of development. I'm a preacher, not a fundraiser. And then one woman said, well, we wouldn't have needed all this church if it weren't for you. It's your fault that we're in here. <laughs> that was not the answer they wanted. And it was that moment in 2005 that I began to ask the question, how long should I do this? This was year 15. We had built houses. We had done a micro lending program for small business. We had done foster care and adoption. We did health care with a Catholic hospital. We had done economic development through commercial real estate. We had done enough in 15 years for me to be able to send a letter somewhere and say, you know what? I've done my job. And I was, prepared, I was really prepared to, uh, to move on and let them get a young, articulate, dynamic, charismatic fundraiser. Until the morning that I was to return to the board to give them my response to their question, what are we going to do? Thinking in the back of my mind that the answer was I should resign and make room for someone else. And I got out of my car the morning of the meeting to a packed parking lot full of late model cars. Now that may not disturb you and it may not sound dramatic uh, at all, but let me say it to you this way. Those cars began talking to me. Now I'm not a religious fanatic. I'm not known for many epiphany experiences. You know, I'm pretty basic. I did go to Princeton, so you know I'm not that deep. I'm just, you know, basic exegesis, hermeneutics, you know, homiletical structure. But on this particular morning, I had a spiritual revelation. Because I realized when I looked at those cars, Mercedes-Benz, BMWs, Cadillacs, there was even a Maserati in the parking lot. 
I had heard of Maseratis, but I, never, I had never seen one in my life. And there was only one person in that congregation that I knew could afford a Maserati, and that was not his. And I realized then that I had the answer to almost all of my questions. Question number one was, how will we proceed at our church in light of all of the church's debt? Question number two is, since the civil rights days, the 50s and the 60s, what has happened to the people who said, if you remove all of these barriers, we will be able to accomplish all of those things that we have a right to accomplish? I, I had all of these questions, and those cars in the parking lot answered every one of my questions. And they did because those cars represented to me a congregation of people whose lifestyles mimicked the lifestyle I had lived for 15 years of my life. I, I was raised by basic middle class people. My dad was a school teacher and a part time preacher. My mom was a secretary. We lived in my grandmother's house uh, until I was in sixth grade when we could afford our own house. These were people of modest means, but th these were, were people who were loving and we had a close-knit family, and, and they handled money so much differently than I had begun to handle money when I turned 18. My mother would take me to the store with her, and, and she'd see a $60 dress. She'd give the man $10 for her $60 dress. I'd be embarrassed and say, Mom, you can't pay $10 for a $60 dress. But she'd say, no, I know what I'm doing. And she'd tell the man, look, take this $10 and hold that dress. The next month, she'd take $15. The next month, she'd take $20. And after she paid for the dress, she'd bring the dress home. So that's the kind of environment I was raised in. You know, you pay first and bring home later. But when I turned 18 years old and had my first car, I was on my way to Rutgers as a student. I got a letter in the mail from the Gulf Oil Company. They said, Mr. Soares, congratulations. They sent me my first credit card. Prior to getting that credit card, I would spend one dollar a week on gas. I'd go to the gas station, get a dollar worth of gas, and drive all week long. So you don't know about that. That's back in the days of Henry Ford. You buy a dollar worth of gas a day, and your needle will go down and not up. But when I got that credit card, I went to the gas station, and I said, fill it up. My income had not risen, but my spending power had risen astronomically, not because I had money, but because I had credit. My grandmothers never had credit. My grandparents never had credit. My parents did not live on credit cards. My parents lived the way my mother exemplified when buying her dresses, pay first and use later. But when I was 18 years old, without having asked any questions, what happened to me is what happened to millions of people. We, we became caught in this tidal wave of economic shift where easy access to credit, coupled with marketing strategies that were aimed at our feelings instead of those functions, converged. And by the end of the civil rights era, when we were focused on social justice and progress, there, there was a tidal wave that we were not prepared to swim in. And so by the 1970s, we began this trek collectively as a country, this trek towards being consumed by consumption. I tell my students, some of them are here tonight, that when my grandmother bought a refrigerator, she bought the refrigerator based on its functionality. And so she'd compare how quickly the refrigerator made ice or how much space there was for ice. Where would she put her vegetables? How much space would there be for meat? Could she put food in that would be preserved for, for the rest of the week so that we could eat leftovers from Sunday? My, my grandmother would make selections for items like refrigerators based on their function. But today, the marketing and advertising industry focuses more 
on how products make you feel more so than how products actually function. And so we have this emotional connection now to products and we buy impulsively more than, more, than, more than we buy in any other way. And this started right around the same time that I began asking the question, what has happened to us? And it happened to everybody. The problem is today, if, if you look at the numbers, what you discover that African Americans have as a median family net worth about 20 times less than Caucasian Americans, and therefore the people who can least afford to spend money based on feelings are African Americans, but it's not a black problem. It's Hispanics, it's Asians, it's men, it's women, it's old, it's young. It's when Pepsi began competing with Coke, not based upon how much better Pepsi tastes than Coke, but Pepsi began a whole new strategy at the end of the 60s and argued that Pepsi was the choice of a new generation. And that generation was not calculated in age. That generation was calculated in feelings. And the subtext of the Pepsi movement, and not just Pepsi, Dodge wanted you to buy a Challenger so that you, would need, you need not challenge the system, just drive a Challenger and you'll feel like you're rebellious. Matter of fact, they have a rebellion too. So all of these countercultural values of the 60s, according to Thomas Frank in his great book, The, cool, the Conquest of Cool, these, these subcultural and countercultural values, this rebellion and so-called revolution of the 60s was ultimately co-opted by Madison Avenue so that we no longer had to stand up and street, speak truth to power. We no longer needed to embrace the idea that we should challenge uh, 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 states that try to deny people their voting rights, just, just spend the right money on the right product and you can be cool and you can be rebellious and you can be relevant just by consuming. It's, it's a sinister kind of uh, development because when you really plow down deeply into the infrastructure of this consumption, what you see is that the, the, the free enterprise system based on markets became a kind of shield to defend consumer capitalism, which marketed desire more than it marketed products. So we spend time now doing the inglamorous task of sitting down with people, young and old, helping them to discern and decide the difference between their needs and their, and their wants. And when a people cannot distinguish between needs and wants, then those people will spend $250 a month on nonsense through premium cable and will have nothing saved for the emergency. to protect them from disaster. My, my friends with, with whom I was raised and who still do some of that protest work that I was trained to do um, are a bit disturbed with me because it, it sounds to them as if what we're doing is what they call blaming the victim. And the argument is that I should be focused as a man of faith on the financial issues that flow from public policy. And so the mayor of New York, for instance, wants to raise the minimum wage to $8.75 an hour. And I happen to agree with President Obama when he says that no person should work 40 hours a week and still be poor at the end of that week. I, I happen to agree with that. However, If increasing income were the solution 
to the economic gaps and economic disparity of the nation, then how do you explain the NFL and the NBA? Minimum wage in the NBA is $375,000 a year. Yet three out of five players from the National Basketball Association filed for bankruptcy within three years of retirement. If those numbers hold true, that would suggest that we could raise the minimum wage to $375,000 a year, and 60% of us would still be in trouble. In the National Football League, it's worse than that. In the National Football League, 78% of the players in the National Football League filed for bankruptcy, and bankruptcy simply means that you owe more than you have, within three years of retirement. So is the question a lack of capital, or, or is the question how, have, how can we redeem ourselves and liberate ourselves and free ourselves from this financial slavery that has affected the way we use the resources we have. And when I began thinking about that, I was rescued in my thoughts from this ancient proverb that comes from the Hebrew Bible that says that the slave is the one who borrows from the lender, that the borrower is slave to the lender. And so I looked at, I looked at our congregation in 2000 Five, and I said to our board this, I said, I am not a fundraiser, but here's what I know. I know that a good percentage of our church members are living today the way I lived between the time I was 18 and the time I was 33. My, my lifestyle had become one of living paycheck to paycheck, paying last month's bills with next week's check, writing a check, and hoping I get to the bank before the check bounces, using a credit card, praying that they don't come back because it was declined. It was a life of talking to bill collectors, not even opening my mail because I knew I didn't have the money and I knew the banks weren't sending me birthday cards. And when I began doing the research, what I realized was that the membership that I was serving was, again, a microcosm of the country that our country had become enamored with credit. We were drowning in consumer credit. And the sinister thing about it is that there are people who, in very important places, who want us to believe that the solution to the economic crisis of the country is that we spend more money. In fact, after 9-11, the most offensive statement that the president made to me was when he said, the way we should recover from 9-11 is go shopping. Now, the traditional answer to what we do is described as financial literacy. But when, when you look at the, the, the numbers that match the lifestyle, what you, what you see very clearly is that this is not an issue of information. And the tragedy in all of this is that the fastest growing sector in the Christian faith is the movement led by clergy who call themselves prosperity preachers. It's bad enough when the culture says to me, if you feel bad today, go shopping. That's bad. I mean, the idea that we would have something called retail therapy, or even worse, window shopping, when we're not shopping for windows. We're really looking through the windows at things we can't afford, but it makes us feel better. What I call in my book uh, compensatory consumption. When we're spending money to buy things to, to compensate for our feeling of non-significance. And so if my wife drives me crazy, if my children get on my nerves, if my boss disrespects me, if my coworkers can't be trusted, if I'm the victim of road rage on the highway, the way I resolve that is go shopping. 
That's a part of our uh, cultural theology now. That, that's bad. It gets worse when uh, Vance Packard emerges as the modern day prophet saying, you know, there's something called status seekers where we, where we, we, we are drowning in conspicuous consumption, where we spend more money on the things that make us, that give us status. So conspicuous consumption is aimed at getting us status. And so I'll spend $40 more on a shirt that has a picture of a man on a horse holding a stick playing a game I don't understand. <laughs> so I look up one day and find myself a full of, a, 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 a closet full of polo shirts and I've never been to a polo match in my life. But there's status in polo. And I'll pay more for the status. That's, 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 that's even worse. What's even worse is what many experts call confused consumption, where I, I just don't know better. So I, I'll pay, I'll pay $4.50 for a cup of coffee that I don't even like. Whose logo, by the way, tells it all. I mean, isn't it interesting that Dunkin' Donuts logo is a coffee cup? But they sell donuts. Dunkin' Donuts makes more money off of coffee than it does donuts, and so their logo has a cup of coffee on it. Starbucks, which is supposed to sell coffee, has a logo that has a mythical Greek siren, the imagery representing the truth about it. I don't know why, but there's something about this that just lures me in. And so people wait in line at 6.30 in the morning to buy coffee they can't even drink without putting all that stuff in it. So we have this confused consumption which is, which is non-analytical, emotional, uninformed, almost stupid kind of consumption. And on top of all of these forces that come from every sector of society, we have preachers that will get up on Sunday morning and be on television every day convincing people that God wants them to have things that they can't afford. You can't win. If you feel better spending money, and you look more important spending money, and you're oblivious to reality spending money, and God says, well done, you're dead. And so this prosperity movement takes faith and makes it the weapon of consumer capitalism and materialism and mass consumption so that the merchants of God become the promoter of products that exacerbate the weak economic structure that minimizes people's choices. And so some of us argue, well, you know, we need better schools so that the people who are stuck in certain neighborhoods can be sure their children have access to better schools. Other, others of us argue that if people made different choices, they could just move, just move. And it's alarming, they, they, they can tell you, it's alarming to watch the process of discovery where people equate financial slavery to chattel slavery and develop the passion to rise above consumer debt, financial delinquencies, deficit living, and move into an era of responsibility and opportunity. Now it's hard work because since the 80s, we, we've had uh, government policies that have allowed for unbridled corporate behavior. And so we see this global economic crisis that we're still trying to climb our way out of where the bankers came up with a scheme that was endorsed by the rating agencies and we have global economic meltdown because they were able to bundle bad loans into a package that made the package look like a good deal. And the investment community made tons of money, the rating agencies made tons of fees and people lost their homes and the bankers just switched companies and kept on keeping on. 
And so it's hard because one of the most unfortunate developments in this post-regulatory environment has been the emergence of the worst predators ever known to our culture that have seized upon people's lack of financial resources and growing appetite for things, and that's the payday lender. I was telling these scholars at dinner that, that the, uh, the payday loan industry it has grown so quickly and has moved so strategically that many intelligent people don't even know what I'm talking about when I mention payday loans. In New Jersey, it usually comes in by email. You'll get an email from time to time, and email will say, uh, need extra cash? <laughs> no credit check? All you need is a job. We can get you $1,000 in 15 minutes. And if you've had a uh, transmission breakdown on your car and have no savings, if you've had an emergency problem and can't make the copay, if you've had uh, a bump up in your utility bill because of cold weather, if you've had any kind of emergency, if you need to move because your landlord was not paying his mortgage but you were paying your rent and now the bank is taking the apartment building, you have to move, and you need a deposit for your next apartment. Any one of those things could cause you to answer the question, do you need extra cash? Yes! And believe that the email came from God. Problem is, what they don't tell you is that they'll lend you $1,000, they'll charge you $15 per hundred, which in this case is $150, and uh, you have to pay it back on payday. Well, if I get paid next Thursday and I don't have $1,000 a day and I need it, it's not likely that I'll have $1,000 Thursday. And what they don't tell you is that most people who say yes to that question end up needing nine more of those loans to pay back the original loan. And what they don't tell you is that each time they renew the loan, they're going to charge you another $150. And what they don't tell you is that the annual percentage rate based on those numbers is not 15%, even though 15 is 15% 15 of 100, it's actually 390% because 15% of 1,000 really would be $15 if you had a year to pay it back. But if I lend you $1,000 and you have to pay it back within two weeks, I have to multiply two weeks times 26 because Two weeks comes every 26 times a year, which comes to 390. And they are very intelligent people who don't realize that the payday loan industry is legally charging people 700 and 800 and 900 percent interest, given the fact that they need nine more loans to pay back the original. And the government will not restrict payday lenders to 36 percent interest. We have, we have a meeting in Washington tomorrow asking for government assistance. They've done it with military, thank God, because the payday industry was so greedy and so corrupt, they actually strategically set up their payday loan stores right outside of military bases. And thank God for General Petraeus' wife because she led the movement to have federal legislation to at least limit the amount of money that military personnel would have to pay on payday loans to 36%. But I wish you could hear the arguments that the payday industry offer as to why 36% is not enough for them to charge in interest. And so come with me to Ohio and you'll see that on the websites of the payday industry, they actually advertise their interest rates properly and people who can see that they'll pay seven to 800% interest on a $100 to $1,000 loan, they still do it. And they don't do it because they're creeps. They don't do it because they're dumb. They do it because they're caught in this tidal wave and quagmire of economic duplicity. And there are more payday loan stores in America today than there are McDonald's and Starbucks combined. And this industry really just started to take off in 1990. So now we have not only personal responsibility, but we have social justice, and the question that the church has to answer in my tradition is the same question that Jeremiah had to answer from Zechariah, is there any word from the Lord? If you people claim to 
promote the idea that life is bigger than the things that we own. If faith suggests that there is a divinity that is superior to our humanity, if religion seeks to empower people and uplift people so that their lives can be more worth living, if, if a church in the middle of a neighborhood is to be relevant to the people in the neighborhood so that the land, according to local land laws in New Jersey, we say that a church is an inherently beneficial use of land, which means that the church doesn't pay taxes. Our church doesn't pay property taxes. If we paid property taxes, we'd probably have to pay forty dollars to $50,000 a year tax on the land that we occupy, yet we get police service, we get fire service, we have all of the benefits of our community without having to pay any taxes at all. And so the moral question for the church is, do we owe anybody anything? And if we do, then it would seem that we would construct a behavior that responds to the most sinister and serious needs that people have. And today, those needs revolve around our ability to use the resources that we have to have some modicum of quality in life. Unfortunately, if you look at the history of money and Christianity. It has evolved from a system that began with collecting money to take care of the poor. That's why the church needed money. We didn't have cathedrals in the year 60 and 70 and 80 and 90. We didn't have cathedrals. We didn't have mortgages to pay. Didn't really have pre preachers to pay. The collections in the early church were to make sure that the widows and the orphans and the people without means had access to communal support. That's what, that's what the money was for. In the Jewish tradition, even the agricultural culture systematically provided for people who were poor. And so the whole book of Ruth is built around this model of being able to glean from those who had resources and the poor always had access because of the culture and the religious standards. And it really doesn't matter if you look at Islam, if you look at Buddhism, if you look at Hinduism, this idea that, that the spiritual dimension of humanity compels us toward the other. It suggests that when faith in, in, in divine presence should compel us to behavior that extends beyond ourselves, this modern phenomenon of selfishness becoming normal for religion, that's, that's frightening. In, in, in the Wall Street Journal, I wrote an article about the, the so-called prosperity gospel and described it as an ecclesiastical pyramid scheme where the people at the top get rich, the people at the bottom stay poor, and God gets blamed for it. And people are made to feel that they're poor because they have no faith as opposed to being victims of systems that have left them out or kept them down. And so we, 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 are, we have embarked upon this mission to address both the personal capacity and the systemic realities that, that, that merge and, and create this morass of moral duplicity and ambiguity. And if we are, if we are not careful, the Western faith, Western religion, the Western church, be it small or large, be it evangelical, Pentecostal, or mainline, it will become irrelevant. Because as we travel the world, we're in Haiti building water wells, we're in Africa helping with entrepreneurship and micro lending. As we, as we travel the world, what we see is that people, people need to survive. And it's, it's, it's not enough to 
sit back in the comforts of our homes and watch Donald Trump as he decides which celebrity he's going to hire or fire. But the question for the faith community is, can your faith in the unseen show up in tangible ways for those who need to see some benefits right now? And so what we've opted to do is create this hybrid, as it were, of both social consciousness and personal responsibility with outcomes that can benefit families and also inform public policy. On a, on a practical level, um, we invite people to do this in groups because the culture has made consumption addictive. And so we buy shoes and neckties and cars and T-shirts and designer labels out of habit now. My grandmother was a uh, domestic worker, but she always had money, and she always had money, despite having a husband who wouldn't work, despite having eight children, despite making below minimum wage, because she just didn't have to buy stuff. She didn't have to buy every new dress that came out, every shoe style that changed. She was who she was. And so at its core, faith redefines identity. And if my identity is shaped by my faith, then I don't need the things that society says make me who I am. But if my identity is connected to my things, then I will have to buy more things to be more of myself. And even if I don't have space to hold those things in my house, when I run out of space in my attic, in my basement, in my guest room, in my kids' room, in my garage, I'll pay a stranger $29.99 over on Route 1, say, you hold my stuff. <laughs> it, it's been called affluenza, the inability to cope with prosperity and the meaninglessness of our success. Every great development and accomplishment that's happened in our country has had a faith component, component, from the abolition of slavery to the expansion of access to health care. And I, and I believe the movement that frees people from being consumed by consumption and equips people with the tools that we need to be self-sufficient, that too will have to have a faith component. Otherwise, we all become slaves to the system. And we are nothing but uh, barcodes living to satisfy the whims of someone else's appetite. So for those who are people of faith, you pray for us. And we invite you to do what you can in your own way where you are, in your own space, to respond with faith to this tremendous challenge, and I do believe uh, deep in my heart that we shall overcome. Thank you. Right. 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 One of my students. One of my students, not your students, Bob. <laughs> yeah, debt cetera. That's a that's that's a good descriptive uh, word that I think uh, punctuates the problem. 
Many of our students, when we go through our process, don't know how much money they owe. It's just, it's just, it's just a part of life. But most of our requests for counseling from couples is about money. Majority of the marriages that don't make it started with some rupture over money. Many of the crimes that our children commit have uh, money at the center. Much of the failure um, that people experience emanate from an inability to control matters related to money. It, it's, it's the elephant in the room. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when I told my board, I told my board this. I said, I'm not going to engage in any special fundraising at all. No gimmicks, no special gestures. We're going to help our members get out of debt, and they will have greater capacity and willingness to help the church get out of debt. One person stood by me. The rest thought I had lost my mind. One. Yeah, one, just one person, and one out of, I would say, about 150. So we were in a serious minority. <laughs> they didn't see it. They just, they just didn't see it. And the more we've looked at it and the broad implications of these issues and the faith connection, take the story of the Good Samaritan, I mean, not the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son. All of us in Christian traditions even outside of Christian traditions, are familiar with the story of the prodigal son. However, the story has become so moralized that the economic facts that stare us in the face are completely missed. The, the prodigal son story really grows out of three weaknesses. Number one, impatience. The kid said to his father, give me my inheritance now. I can't wait for you to die. That's why we use credit cards. We're impatient, and borrowing speaks to impatience. So that's one. Two, when his father gave him the money, he took all of it with him. He, he didn't leave any in uh, an emergency account. He didn't donate any to charity. He took it all. He took every penny. And one of the challenges we have is building lifestyles around uh, at least diversifying what we do with the money. And then the third thing is when he got where he was going, he spent everything, spent it, just spent it. And we have children, we have children whose parents will argue that the system is unfair and that's why I can't make it, yet they'll buy their children $315 sneakers. So, so, so we, 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 you, know, Dr., you know, Dr. King is very interesting, Dr. King, has become so, uh, so per his message has become so perverted. So we hear Dr. King say, I have a dream. I've been to the mountaintop. And in that same speech, Dr. King said, open a bank account. <laughs> you know, he talked about a balance. That's the point, balance. And, and we just don't hear. And so as a result, It, it, takes, it, it takes some time to get people to see, but it only takes me about 12 minutes. You give me 12 minutes in the most hostile audience and, and I'll have them on their knees because these, these facts are, uh, are unavoidable. I'm not proud of it. Yeah, I'm not proud of it. We, you, can't, you, can't, you can't spend $5 a day on coffee and say you're poor. You, you can't spend $250 a, week, a month on pay-per-view and say you can't afford insurance, you see? And until there's a shift, what I respect about many of my friends who are in various immigrant communities, they get this day one, day one. You know, my Iranian friends don't wear $2,000 suits, ever. My, my Korean friends don't, don't drive Maseratis. None of them. 
none of my immigrant friends, my Nigerian friends that own businesses, they, they, they often don't wear neckties at all. I've got all these neckties all over my house. But they own businesses, and they pool their resources, and they're making this flawed America work for them because they come with different values and different perspectives. And uh, I, just think, I, I just think people of faith have to, ha have, to, have to take a look at that seriously. But religion, you're doing history of evangelicalism, right? I mean, what, what happened in the 20th century, uh, especially Christian um, evangelicalism, it became co-opted by consumer capitalism. And so Christianity began defining success in very secular terms. And so success for us is the size of your building and the, and, and the members in your church and the viewers on your broadcast. And, and now in, in some circles, the size of your jet. You know, we've got a guy in Georgia that preaches every Sunday morning in, uh, in Georgia and every Sunday night in California. Flies out there by private jet. Last time I checked, you know, if there are people in California that need to hear the word, God will send somebody over there. What I need to, I, I, could send, I could send 10 kids to college on the fuel that he spends flying to California. You have to assume that God, if, if, if you believe in God, you have to assume that God knows there's some folk in California that need to hear the word. But, but there is a propensity. I didn't get into this, but there's this propensity to cave into celebrity culture. And so preachers are now celebrities in addition to being prophets. And so we can put prophets before faith since it, it, our celebrity culture gives us permission to do that. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's shameful, but it's more shameful if we have no response to it. Yeah, Doc. Yeah, yeah. In between the credit card, the credit loan, the auto loans, and <laughs> furniture loans, just this making money off of money, coupled with the emergence of shopping centers and 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 the like, the, the culture. I mean, if you look at the '70s and beyond, it's so different. I, I used to when, when I first started out, I did a lot of work with teenagers, and in the '70s, it was driving parents crazy that their teenagers, who were born in the 60s and now 15, 16, were, were flocking to these shopping malls. The culture had shifted that quickly. And one woman said to me, you know, Reverend, I, I, I just, I can't do anything with my son. He just insists on going to shopping malls. So I asked her the question, what do you think is wrong with your son going to shopping mall every Saturday? So, I say, so she said to me, well, oh, I, don't, I don't really know. All I know is that when I was 16, I didn't go to shopping malls every Saturday night. And I told her, when you were 16, there were no shopping malls. <laughs> you know, there were no shopping malls. So, so, so this, this uh, uh, and I'm hoping you'll, you'll really dig deeply into this. this. This was not new, this idea, you know, in the late, in the late 1800s, uh, not only was, was there a shift in uh, marketing and commerce, you know, there was this notion, I, you've probably bumped into this notion of uh, intentional obsolescence. You bumped into that? Where, where, where the idea after the Depression, the, the thought was that products would be made with uh, intentional obsolescence, meaning they wouldn't last too long. And if I could sell you a battery and get you hooked on the battery, but the battery would die, you know, in a certain amount of time, it would increase the likelihood that you'd buy another battery. So, so one answer, you know, it was, it was seen, it was, it was 
described as being obscure at that time, but it wasn't obscure, that obscure at all. One, one answer to the question of how can the economy recover back after the Depression was, uh, was to, to, to promote this notion of, uh, it, and the word wasn't intentional, they used another word. It was, well, planned obsolescence, right? Planned, thank you. Planned obsolescence. Then the Japanese came along and said, okay, fine. You want to make your cars so they only last three years? We'll, we'll, we'll come with another car. And the Japanese were able to invade our market because they were able to turn planned obsolescence on its head despite the fact that, that we said we hated the Japanese. We, we claimed as a nation to still be angry at Japan, but when they came along with those cars, Mitsubishi, Toyota, huh? and those cars lasted 10 years, and our cars started falling apart in three, they said, look, we love the Japanese, and we don't love them, we love their cars. So, 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 so all the planned obsolescence, easy access to credit, advertising based on market segments, messages that make me feel better about my purchases. That, that convergence, especially for African Americans, but not limited to African Americans, that convergence, it, it, it changed this country. Look at the Volkswagen. I mean, we, we, we fought Germany. We hated Germans. We said the Volkswagen was ugly. So here we have an ugly car manufactured by our enemy that took the market in the 1950s. That, that was an advertising coup. But it had nothing to do with the Germans, it had nothing to do with the car. It had to do with the shift in the way marketers and, and uh, who, who, who began employing psychologists to help with those messages began to tap into our psyche. Now, from an ethnic perspective, you know, they discovered that black people uh, smoke cool cigarettes, and so we had black people in ads smoking cool. We thought it was social progress. We didn't realize that they were tapping into our ethnic psyche. And today, today it's really, I mean, you know, you, the Super Bowl is no longer about football. There are people who don't know who won the Super Bowl, but know who won the advertising contest. <laughs> The Super Bowl is more about advertising than it is about football. That we just tolerate the football. To the point that for the for 32 minutes the game was dark and nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. Because the game is no longer about football, it's about advertising. Maybe I could ask one last yeah. question. Well, the possibility, we're swimming upstream, number one, because the payday industry specifically, it is, such, it is so flush with cash that they have bought many of the significant Democrats and Republicans across the country, and they will not say a word. I was telling Bob and his team uh, before we came over that I was in Florida speaking to a group of legislators, and while I was being introduced, my host, who was a state senator, whispered in my ear of how much good the payday store owner in that town had been to the town while I was being introduced. I went to another city where the uh, member of Congress is married to the lawyer who represents the payday industry in that town, and the driver who took me back to the airport told me that I should be concerned about my life. So, so the, the, tomorrow we're meeting with the uh, Consumer Finance Board in Washington. They, they are the only public entity that, that uh, has any hopes, uh, Mrs. Petraeus works there, has any hopes of at least recommending any policies that would put uh, restrictions on this industry. I've had I've come screaming and kicking, you know. I've had the Center for the Center for Responsible Lending out of Durham does all of our research and they do some coordination, 
And they, they've had to bring me screaming and kicking to endorse the principle that they be capped at 36%. I have a hard time advocating for a policy that gives people permission to charge 36% interest. But even then, we find legislatures, um, in, in Missouri, we couldn't get on the ballot. In Michigan, it was thrown off the ballot. In Alabama, we can't get it passed, the Birmingham City Council. I mean, all across the country, the payday industry shows up and just pays people. They just pay people, they just write checks, any amount of money. The payday industry spends more money on lobbying than, than I think the tobacco industry today. I mean, they're, they're just huge and they're everywhere. And public policy today is driven by money. More than it's driven by principle or anything else, it's driven by money. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, I'm focused like a laser on the payday issue because it is, it is in fact the worst. But we have car, lido, car, car title loan uh, stores. We have uh, cash for gold. We have check cashing facilities. All of these have exorbitant fees attached to them, which, which are equivalent to, to predatory lending rates. And in, in African-American communities, 54% of the African-Americans in this country have no bank account or have a bank account they don't use, 54%. So half of the black people you know are using predatory lending or alternative financial services just to basically pay our bills, to pay our PSE&G bills, to pay our cell phone bills. We're, we're using money orders, check cashing joints, and payday lenders. 54%, 21% have no bank accounts at all. And 33% have bank accounts that, that we don't use to conduct our weekly business. Hispanics are just a little below that. And we have no response, none. There's no national civil rights organization who, that will discuss it. They take money from the payday lenders. Payday lenders will buy two tables, to a civil rights dinner and shut them down completely. Congressional Black Caucus won't say a word about it, not a word. You never heard the president say the words payday loans, never. So we're swimming upstream, we're swimming upstream. Even the banks, many of them, the, the large banks, have either formed subsidiaries because the payday, the payday industry is making so much money. So the banks have either formed subsidiaries to do payday lending, or they've done joint ventures with some of the payday lending companies like Advance America to go into bid with the payday lenders. They're regular banks, real banks. So when people talk about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, that's not just hyperbolic ranting from radical left-wing people. The economic model of this culture, it, it facilitates that. And without structural change, then, then uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I believe that the faith community must have a response across doctrinal and, and, and uh, theological lines. Thank you.